Well, good morning. Welcome to those of you who are joining us online today as well. Today we continue with our sermon series on the Ten Commandments with the Eighth Commandment, Do Not Bear False Witness Against Your Neighbor. And you might be wondering, wait, the Eighth? What happened to the Seventh? Good question. It's still there. <laughs> but you shall not steal has a lot in common with last week's command, as in you shall not steal your neighbor's spouse. And it has a lot in common with next week's commands, you shall not covet your neighbor's stuff or relationships. Odds are, if you're going to steal something, it started with you coveting it in your heart, right? So even though the seventh commandment isn't getting its own day, you're going to hear more about the heart of that next week. And this week's command to love our neighbor is about not letting our words steal someone else's good name or reputation. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Now, at first glance, this commandment just looks like don't commit perjury. And I'm guessing with the number of times that you have been called into court, you probably feel like you can check this one off your list. <laughs> but in the scriptures, this command to tell the truth about your neighbor shows up not just around court, but in every aspect of life. And you might have guessed that this commandment actually helped shape the original practice of how courts in our country swore in witnesses to offer testimony, placing a hand on the Bible and vowing, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. That original statement was a reminder, not only that this is a promise that you're making to the people involved in this case to be truthful in what you say, but it also was a reminder that there's a higher authority, even than the court, who will hold you accountable for your words. Because this isn't just one of our country's laws. This is one of God's laws. Do not bear false witness against your neighbor. But the thing is, as God's people, this is always what God asks of us when we speak of our neighbor, whether we're in court or not, especially when our words impact the way that person might be seen by others. Our words have power, and because they do, we must use them responsibly and carefully as we would hope that others would use their words when speaking of us. Martin Luther's small catechism explanation of this commandment says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. What does this mean? We are to fear and love God so that we do not betray, slander, or lie about our neighbor, but defend him, speak well of him, and explain his actions in the kindest way. Like the other commands we've looked into, not, this not only tells us what to avoid, but also directs us how to live intentionally in the way of Christ. Jesus summarized these love your neighbor commands in one succinct phrase in Matthew 7. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. So the eighth commandment is about how we love our neighbor as ourselves in how we use our words. So what does that look like? Well, in court, that legal vow might seem a bit redundant. The truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. But each part there has a purpose. Because we can intend to tell the truth, but choose to tell only part of it. Maybe to protect ourselves in some way. But in doing that, we might be holding back things that might actually serve to paint a better picture of our neighbor. So in court, we are called to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And that nothing but part is significant because it's meant for the purposes of the court to steer us away from giving unintentional false witness. Because like it or not, we are all wired to expound on the truth. And we do this naturally. It's a self-preservation instinct. In order to protect ourselves, we are always trying to figure out the motives behind people's words and actions. And the only filter we have to use is our own experience. And when we decide what we think their reason was for doing or saying what they did, then we respond back to them based on our assumption, whether it's actually true of them or not. And this propensity toward assuming leads to all kinds of hurt and trouble. And if you want an example of this, check out the scene three-fourths of the way through any romantic comedy. <laughs> So when in court, they ask for the truth, the whole truth, 
and nothing but the truth. What they're saying is, tell me what you saw, not what you think it means, not why you think they did it. Tell the truth. So help you, God. Because we absolutely need God's help to speak truth. We are constantly tempted to make up our own narratives instead of letting people speak for themselves. And we're not always even aware that we're doing it. For flawed and broken human beings like us, even what we claim as truth about someone else may largely be our own perception, built from our own experiences, layered over the life of someone whose life has been nothing like our own and whose motives look nothing like our assumptions. Jesus himself was often target of people's uncharitable assumptions and still is, frankly. He was slandered constantly with sometimes contradictory claims. At his own trial, false witnesses came to speak against him, even trying to use what he said against him by misrepresenting what he had said. And earlier in his ministry, they spoke up, assuming the worst possible motives to his actions. In Matthew eleven nineteen, 19, Jesus said, The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Here's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. In a world that often uses words to confuse and accuse and defame, in the end, it's our actions that speak. That's the witness that Jesus chose. So like Jesus, in the face of uncharitable words, we are to let our defense be our actions of love and grace. And if our actions have not shown love or grace, may we be quick to confess our fault and seek forgiveness. Because truly, only God knows the heart. And no matter what we think we know about someone else's motives, no human being has the ability to see the heart of another. Which is why bearing witness truthfully about someone else never involves what we assume. Unless, as Martin Luther suggests, we choose to assume the best of them until they prove otherwise. Our tongues are to be tamed by grace because we've all been on the other side of that scenario, haven't we? Think right now of a time that someone lied about you, assuming the worst about your motives and presenting your intentions or actions to others in the worst possible way. It still hurts, doesn't it? Now, can you imagine a world in which in every misunderstanding, People choose to assume the best about your motives or choose to have grace for you over things that you've said or done that were not your best choices. A world where what others speak of you publicly is always charitable and where the truth gets worked out in conversation between you, where you can hear the truth in love and can speak to that truth, to your own actions and offer explanation or apology where your reputation is never sullied before the world before you even have a chance to know there's an issue or a misunderstanding? That's the kind of world God wants for us. Do not bear false witness against your neighbor it means more than don't lie about them because you might think the truth is this person is a jerk. <laughs> but there's only one judge of humankind who can render that verdict, and it's not you. Telling your truth about someone is most likely not actually the whole truth and nothing but the truth. When researching to make the movie Titanic, James Cameron went through all of the eyewitness accounts from that night. Do you know what he found? No two people had the exact same story of when the ship broke or how it started to sink or what side went down first. No details fully aligned. So was everyone lying? Of course not. They were all telling the truth of their experience filtered through what they noticed from their own vantage points. Even when people tell the truth with no desire whatsoever to deceive, the truth they tell is filtered through their own perspective. So Cameron had to take all of those accounts and figure out the position of each witness and how their experience connected with the others and the physical evidence of the wreckage. And he had to try to see from all those varied perspectives in order to grasp what truly happened. And in the end, the truth was much more complex than any one person's story. But each perspective added to the full picture. 
There needed to be one completely outside the experience to begin to see the whole story. And the same is true for us. In the court of life, we are called neither to be judge or jury because God alone holds that role. So when we're called to bear witness to the life of another, we're not called to judge. We are called to speak the truth in love, without embellishment, and with all humility. Because again, our perception of what's true is only from our eyes. Only God sees the whole story. Our role then is to use our words carefully as we would hope that others would use their words about us. Because the court of human life is always in session and our judge hears the testimony that we give about others every single day. And not only does he see the full truth of what's actually true about our neighbor's hearts compared to what we say about them, but he also sees the truth of my heart and of yours about why we say what we do about them. And to him, what we bear witness to with our words actually reveals more about us than anyone else. Jesus says in Luke 6:45. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And in Matthew 15, Jesus says in verses 11 and then again in 19, what goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person. Our words have power. And for the health of our own hearts, as well as our neighbors, how we use them matters. One day when we stand before our Lord, the words we have spoken about others will bear witness to the condition of our hearts. So before we speak, it's good to ask ourselves, what's the condition of my heart right now? What's about to overflow here? Do I need to tend to this first? What kind of case are we building about who we are and how we speak about others? That deeply matters to God. Now the sin being addressed here, of course, is the sin of the tongue, the sin of our words, which can keep on cutting years after any physical wound would have healed. And the truth is our tongues can either be weapons to destroy or tools to build. James chapter 3 talks a lot about the power of the tongue. He compares the power of our tongues to the power of a bit to steer a horse or a rudder to steer a ship or a spark that can burn down a whole forest. The tongue can spread poison, he says, and it's far harder to tame than any animal on earth. James chapter 3, 9 through 10 says, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Our words can be used to bring justice and reveal truth, or they can be used to defame and destroy. And we might want to just think of this as a simple, don't lie, tell the truth command. But the more we look into what it means to speak only truth about each other, the more we see how hard it is to live this well in the world. It's not lost on me that we're talking about this command that's saturated with courtroom imagery when possibly the most impactful court case in our state's ha history is happening right now. A case that carries with it complex issues around truth and action with many possible passionate or painful ramifications. The whole world is watching with fear and hope. No pressure. <laughs> we certainly need to be in prayer for every part of this process. But I think where we are now helps us see some truths about God's intentions for us and about the human heart. God's commands are given for the purpose of helping create a trustworthy world, a safe, healthy, just, peaceful world for everyone. And I think when it was originally created, our court system was meant to reflect that godly purpose. I think the conscious intention of those founding the system meant it to be a place where truth can be spoken and revealed, where hurts can be addressed and redressed in an official and public way that both gives voice and presents evidence about the wrong 
and gives opportunity for the accused to speak to the accusation in an orderly and fair process. But of course, as is true for all of us, those who designed it did so from their own limited perspective of their own lived experience, which often did not translate well into the lived experiences of people of color or women in our history. It should not surprise us as God's people who know the failings of our own sin and our own need for God's grace that no system created by human beings will ever be beyond reproach, including the church. Take any ideal and add human beings, and anyone who knows the history of God's people will believe, no matter how great a system we set up, there are going to be issues. There will always be a need to reevaluate our human efforts. No human law can eliminate sin, because sin lodges in the human heart. If law could eliminate sin, God's law would have done it, right? <laughs> Not human laws. No, the fact is, where human beings are, sin will break into our best intentions, and we won't even always see it. Even our best intentions don't always result in true justice or real peace. That's the reality of living in a broken world. And that's why the justice of God doesn't come through the law. It comes only through the cross. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And before the throne of God, our only move is to plead guilty and throw ourselves on the mercy of the court where the Son of God, Son of Man, stands up and volunteers to take our sentence in his place. On the cross, the crimes against humanity of our words and deeds receive the wrath of God they deserve. And they are left destroyed and buried in the tomb. And yet, here we stand. Because Jesus did that for you and for me. We can be honest about our sin. About the fact that we are not just in our words and deeds. That we do not love God with all our hearts. We do not love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Because in doing so, we're crying out again, I know, I confess, I need your grace, Jesus. I need you to see me not as my deeds prove, but as your deeds redeem. I need you to help me recognize your truth and live it. And when we know how much we need that grace, how can we pretend there is any human being who does not? Where there are human beings, there will be brokenness. But yet in the midst of this broken world, we are called to seek to be people of truth, to rejoice in the truth, and to speak the truth where it can be found. So help us, God. And many times we find to speak truth requires us first seeing things about ourselves that we would rather not see, just as much as things we see in our neighbor. But Jesus' grace and mercy calls us to live with each other as people of his grace. And the book of Ephesians gives us some practical instruction on where to start. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to, to your neighbor, for you are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Knowing our own need for Jesus' truth with a capital T, to redeem our own small t truths by his grace, now is the time for us to ask, are there places in our lives where our tongues need taming? 
Has your heart been overflowing with things that show your need for Jesus' grace and mercy in you? How do you love Jesus by loving others with your choice of words? Commit until Easter not to say anything about anyone else that you would not have them say about you. And then evaluate, what did that intentionality do to your heart? Did it change the way that you saw your neighbor? Then ask the Holy Spirit to bring to mind places where you might need to forgive someone or be forgiven for violations of this commandment. And as you look to the cross, remember the price Jesus paid for you, bearing witness not only to your need for his grace, but also to your willingness to receive from him what only he can give. And ask the Lord who so loved you to tame your tongue with his grace that it may be used to serve him as a tool to build others up in love rather than a weapon to destroy. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you chose to meet us in your grace right where we are. In the brokenness of our humanity, Lord Jesus, that you came to redeem us and to rescue us and recreate us in your grace. So Lord, help us to be people of your grace. And help us to be so firmly anchored in the truth of who we are in you that we can not only forgive those people who have hurt us by their words, but also live to model a better way. As people who utterly rely on your grace, Jesus, help us show that grace to others. Lord, may you build a more trustworthy world here and now through us until the day your kingdom comes in fullness. Live your love in us and may our words bear witness to your grace. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.